Ze hebben pijn voor de pijn. problems with our costs, extremely important in machine learning applications, and in particular when using kind of first order methods like gradient descent, um, we can't really distinguish between minimizers and saddle points. And in particular, we don't really want to get stuck in the saddle point. So part of my work about I'm going to talk today is related to how we can um, come up with some methods motivated by so-called Hamilton-Jacobi differential equations on how to avoid saddle points. Afterwards, um, I'm going to uh, introduce different approaches on how we can use differential equations in the context of label propagation in semi supervised learning, where we can um, kind of start with some underlying graph structures, and then we motivated by wave equations, we can come up with um, model for label propagation. And then finally, I'm going to talk about mathematical approaches to generative modeling. And here in this context, I'm mainly going to focus on generative adversarial networks, but I'm also going to talk shortly about score-based diffusion models. So kind of to get started with, let's um, look a bit into um, number of Index optimization problems for machine learning models. This is joint work with Stan Osher at UCLA and Bao Wang at the University of Utah. And so, um, as part of this work, the main motivation was that um, in machine learning applications, we always have these very complicated energy landscapes with a very large number of local minima. And ideally, of course, we want to end up in this global minimum, which you can kind of see here at the bottom. And quite naturally, if we have a large number of local minimizers, this also means that we will have a large number of saddle points. And of course, we don't want to be kind of be stuck in one of those. So it kind of the idea is with any non-convex optimization problem motivated by machine learning applications that we have kind of some input and output data and we have some weights W which needs to be kind of determined through some minimization procedure. And so the easiest way on how to kind of tackle these um, problems is by uh, just starting with simple gradient descent where we kind of um, do some iterations um, in order to obtain our weight W at iteration k plus one. We kind of look at um, W at the previous iteration minus the learning rate times the gradient of our function f, which we want to minimize. And uh, kind of just a, as an example, uh, these types of problems occur, for instance, in the context of chi means. Clustering and what is kind of important to note is that if we had kind of a couple of given centers, like for instance, uh, centers W1 to WK, then we have some permutation symmetry. So the our function F, which would be kind of evaluated at those centers W1 to WK, takes the same value as if we kind of change W2 and W1 in our representation. And this means that just automatically by these permutations, we get a very large number of local minimizers. And since lo local minimizers are always connected via saddle points, this also means that we get an extremely large number of saddle points. And so the idea on how to kind of approach this model is to look into the PDE literature. And in particular, what is very common there is to consider some appropriate smoothing. Because in the end, what we want to achieve is instead of having functions with a very large number of local minima, we want to kind of smooth it accordingly so that uh, we don't get stuck in these local minima or saddle points. And so this is exactly the motivation why one should consider some appropriate smoothing. And one um, example of these types of smoothing, which one could consider uh, is Laplacian smoothing, where the idea is that we have a matrix A sigma, which is given by the identity plus sigma times the 
one-dimensional Laplacian L. And we want to pre-multiply this, our gradient and gradient descent by the inverse of that matrix. And this motivates to introduce a rather unusual form of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, where indeed we have kind of our A sigma inverse as kind of a smoothing matrix of our gradient. And it turns out that this rather unusual Hamiltonian Jacobi equation actually has a unique viscosity solution, which we can write down here directly. And so kind of given this problem, we can now design a new approximation scheme. So basically either we minimize just the function f as we kind of had originally, or we consider this smoothing term over here in addition. And if one kind of writes down an appropriate scheme to achieve this, then it turns out that this will be strongly related to uh, the Laplacian smoothing gradient descent scheme, which I'm going to introduce afterwards. But first, uh, let's have a short look on how to actually interpret this unique viscosity solution, which we're obtaining here to kind of get a better visual idea of what's going on. So for instance, we are considering a function f of the form which is given here at the bottom, which you can also see in blue over here. So it uh, is a function with a large number of saddle points and local minima. And of course, over here is our global minimum. To, uh, so the main idea of kind of the smoothing procedure and kind of implementing this viscosity solution u in here with fixed value of sigma and changing this parameter t in here shows us that as we increase t, we actually get some smoothing of sol the solution. So for instance, for t being sufficiently large, so in this case 0 0.9, we actually see that our curve is rather smooth and in particular it allows us to find the global minimum of this problem in a much easier way than if you considered our original problem where we might get stuck in a local minimum quite easily. And so this is kind of this PDE motivation is precisely the motivation why um, we're kind of looking at a small adaptation of the gradient descent called the Blasian smoothing gradient descent, where we kind of introduce this additional smoothing of the gradient in the hope that we won't get stuck in local minima. So kind of just to illustrate with a standard gradient descent method, we would kind of walk along this red curve over here, whereas the hope is with the appropriate smoothing, one can kind of directly go to the global minimizer without getting stuck on the way. And in fact, one might wonder, computing kind of an inverse of matrix, especially in very high dimensional settings, can usually be quite computation expensive. However, in this case, it turns out that kind of given the gradient, which we need to compute in any case, all we want to do is kind of compute A sigma inverse times the gradient. Then we can use some um, proofs from Fourier analysis, so in particular, the FFT. And by reformulating this problem, we can actually see that using the inverse FFT and the FFT, we can quite easily compute this A sigma inverse G in this setting. And so kind of using those computational advantages of this approach, what we um, kind of see now is that using a smoothing like this, we will be able to kind of enter the global minimum rather than being stuck in any of those local minima, which you can kind of see here on the way. So this is kind of already quite nice to see that, that Laplace and smoothing gradient descent might work in terms of avoiding uh, local minima, but we are still interested in understanding how this actually compares to avoiding saddle points. And what is kind of very well known is that in the setting of gradient descent, and in fact, also the Laplacian smoothing gradient descent, which I've shown you so far, um, 
if we kind of have some initial data in some subspace of dimension n minus one, we can guarantee that it will converge to a saddle point. So that's kind of just a one dimensional subspace where we won't convert to the saddle point. However, it has been kind of shown in the literature that first of all, if one does occasionally random perturbations of gradient descent, that one can guarantee polynomial time for escaping the saddle point. And similarly, it's also known that gradient descent avoids saddle points asymptotically. So this kind of suggests that if we perturb the Laplace and smooth and gradient descent accordingly, we might also get better results than just uh, this, what happens in the case of gradient descent that if we are in a subspace of dimension n minus one, we converge to the saddle point. And in fact, it turns out that this is indeed the case. So if we vary sigma, we can reduce the dimension of the subspace where we converge to the saddle point. And so here the idea is that we replace the constant sigma by some positive function sigma, which needs to satisfy certain assumptions so that um, we were able to prove it that those are rather weak. So we need sigma to be strictly increasing or strictly decreasing with a positive upper and lower bound. So there are lots of examples of these types of functions which one could consider. And kind of under those assumptions, we were able to um, show that we can guarantee convergence to a global mi minimizer if our initial data is not in a certain subspace. And in this case, the subspace is of dimension n minus one over two as opposed to n minus one as it was the case in the standard gradient descent. So we basically reduce the dimension of the subspace by a factor of two. So this is kind of quite nice to see that um, using these perturbations and this additional smoothing we were able to get um, a significantly smaller subspace where we might run into a saddle point than in other deterministic approaches. Having kind of looked at some problems in the context of optimization, as a next step, I'd like to kind of move to a slightly different topic, namely, um, this is more related to differential equations for label propagation and semi supervised learning. So this work is also motivated by what is kind of known in the community of um, differential equations and more recently in data science, namely that um, many computational models in the context of semi-supervised learning are actually based on differential equations. And since differential equations have kind of been uh, investigated for such a long time, it kind of makes sense to try to combine approaches based on numerical analysis and differential equations with the new field of data science and machine learning. And in particular, the Icona equation has been very powerful in the continuum setting, for instance, to determine continuum shortest paths, or also, for instance, in ray objects, where kind of the, the general idea is that we have some sufficiently nice domain, and then you kind of want to understand how waves propagate to this given domain. And in fact, this is all strongly related to shortest paths and graph distances and data science and machine learning where kind of the main hope is to understand information propagation better. However, in the context of data science, we often don't have those very nice underlying domains, but we have underlying graphs. So what we want to study now is how information propagates in this graph-based setting. And so kind of just some example, uh, if we considered continu some continuous media and want to understand how kind of waves propagate through this um, continuous medium, what we can see immediately that it strongly depends on 
the underlying surroundings. Like, for instance, if we have some constant underlying velocity field, then the dynamics are slightly different to if we, for instance, had a horizontally increasing velocity field. And in the continuum setting, in fact, it's well known that we can come up with different types of modeling approaches to describe the setting. So first of all, um, kind of given some underlying bounded domain with some sufficiently nice boundary, we can look at first arrival times. So this is kind of an optimization problem one can look at based on kind of the equation over here. So basically one minimizes over all possible paths between our starting point and our endpoint. Alternatively, one can also look at problems related to differential equations, for instance, the Icona equation, where kind of the main idea is that one solves some kind of local differential equations, again, still on the sufficiently nice domain, with, equipped with some boundary conditions and some initial data. And last but not least, one can also look at front propagation approaches, where kind of the idea is that we start at some point x not, for instance, and then want to understand how this waves propagates over this given domain. And all these approaches kind of depend on our underlying continuous media and its associated underlying velocity, which is expressed by S here everywhere. And in fact, one can show that even though those three formulations look quite different from each other, they turn out to be all equivalent. And in fact, they are not just equivalent, but they also give us different types of perspective. First of all, in terms of the first arrival times, they are very helpful in terms of the modeling because they are, remember those first arrival times were kind of based on minimizing over all paths between two points. So in terms of kind of the underlying modeling, this is kind of a useful approach because it's much easier to kind of model something like this than immediately come up with good uh, explanations on how to model a local equation, for instance. And this has actually been also used in quite a wide variety of applications like evocation planning or robot navigation or RAIN models, for instance. Then on the other hand, that's kind of this PEDE-based approach where it's much easier to get theoretical results on than solving this complicated optimization <laughs> problem over um, a very large number of potential paths one could go for. And last but not least, the front propagation models, which are based on kind of how waves propagate in our given domain are very useful for developing numerical methods and for finding viscosity solutions. And so this raises the question, having kind of all these methods and models already developed in the continuum setting, what can we actually transfer to the discrete setting, like the graph-based setting? And Right now, we only have a rather scattered image of what's actually happening in the graph-based setting. So on the one hand, you know that um, shortest path exists, there's Sykstra algorithm, and of course, whenever we have a differential equation, we can also consider the analog of the differential equation in the graph-based setting. So by appropriately discretizing the gradients, for instance. And so the hope of our work was to kind of uniform this framework and try to transfer those ideas from the continuum setting to the graph-based setting. And in fact, it turns out that similar to the continuum setting, we can come up with models on the graph-based setting as well. First of all, again, those front propagation models where kind of the idea was that we look at um, evolve, evolving wave fronts so we can, of course, express this in the continuum setting, but also if we have some underlying graphs, we can kind of consider the appropriate discretizations. Then um, in the context of first arrival times, 
again, we can also look at uh, all those possible paths between a starting point and an end point in the graph based setting, where again, as in the continuum setting, the idea is to find the smallest travel time over the set of all possible paths. And last but not least, we can also consider appropriate discretizations of iconal equations. So in the continuum setting, it's most common that one considers kind of the two norm of the gradient of U, but in fact, one can also consider generalizations, for instance, uh, in the P norm. And here, gradient plus denotes the discrete one-sided derivative. Yes, whenever we're kind of in the graph-based setting, we need to kind of discretize the those gradients accordingly. And then having kind of these three different approaches, it turns out that uh, for the special case when P is equal to infinity, this is in fact the front propagation approach is associated with the Dijkstra algorithm. The first arrival time approach can be regarded as uh, minimizing over all possible paths and kind of coming up with an associated travel cost. And last but not least for the local equation, we basically obtain an L infinity graph icona equation. And so the associated update formula, which we obtain is kind of written up here. So this is kind of already very nice that we kind of discovered a connection between Dijkstra's curve, how we can kind of express shorter travel times and the local equation. But of course, as a mathematician, we also wonder what actually happens for a different choice of P. And in fact, we can also come up with an appropriate generalizations for that. The update formulas won't look as nice as the one which are kind of written at the top over here, but it's still possible to kind of come up with appropriate update formulas. One can also generalize um, this minimization over paths to minimize the travel cost. But in fact, to kind of write down those models previously, we only had to minimize over paths. And now we actually also have to minimize over certain subsets of graphs uh, of paths, which kind of makes the optimization problem a bit more complicated. And last but not least, this can also be connected to the LP graph icona equation. And kind of as before, it turns out that we have similar advantages and disadvantages as in the continuum case. So front propagation approaches are very helpful for designing algorithms like the Dijkstra algorithm. In the case of P equal to infinity, the first arrival time is a good approach in the context of the modeling. And the local equations are very helpful for the mathematical analysis of these types of problems. And as in the continuum setting, we are also able to pro prove that we indeed have equivalence between these types of models, that we indeed can confuse uh, front propagation, first arrival time, or discrete generalized iconal equations, depending on which kind of problem we are interested in. And this also motivated us to mainly focus on the discrete generalized iconal equations as they are much easier to handle than, for instance, those very complicated optimization problems. One can also kind of come up with <coughs> some of appropriate limits. So um, these underlying differential equations strongly depend on the underlying grids or graph structures one considers. So for certain cases, we kind of explore how the continuum limit would look like as the number of um, nodes of our graphs goes to infinity. And instead of going into more details on that, one can also look at the associated um, 
numerical simulations. So for instance, here are just some examples of different graphs one could consider, like either a very regular graph, like squares or triangular meshes or hexagonal or rhombus grid, or of course one can also consider uniformly distributed nodes over our given domain, and then run some simulations where one can also kind of show analytically that for the case p equal to two um, depend under certain assumptions on the underlying mesh, we actually always kind of obtain the circular movement. And otherwise it often kind of depends slightly more on the underlying graph structure on how precisely information that is kind of in the center spreads over the rest of the domain. And what is, of course, also of interest is how the scales as the number of nodes go to infinity or at least become larger. So kind of looking at some different examples for p equal to 1, p equal to 2, and p equal to infinity, what we can also see is that in particular for the case p equal to 2, even as uh, the number of nodes becomes larger, we still kind of have the same type of solution. And so having kind of understood these types of graph-based models a bit better, now the question is how we can actually use this for label propagation. Because right now what we basically had, we had a source in the middle and then we kind of looked how the information spreads over our graph. And so this kind of uh, is strongly related to semi-supervised learning where we have uh, large data set and only a rather small number of those data points are actually labeled. And now we want to infer labels for all the unlabeled data points. And so in our context, this means that we have a certain number of uh, labels. Let's say we have K labels. And so from all those given labels, kind of some wave propagates over the domain and we label a point according to which of those K waves arrives first at each of the points. So in the case when we only have, for instance, two labels and those um, points in here at the bottom in orange are labeled as orange and those points in dark blue are labeled as in blue, what we can look at is the travel field associated with the blue wave and the yellow wave. So for instance, here on the left-hand side, we see how the blue wave propagates over our given domain. So darker colors mean that the wave arrives there first and brighter colors mean the wave arrives there later. And here in the middle, the other way around, this is the wave for the yellow points, so initially the yellow wave is mainly here at the top, and then later on it also propagates to the lower parts. And then by taking kind of the minimum time when waves arrive, we can then label our points accordingly. If the yellow wave arrives first, we label it yellow. If the blue wave arrives first, we label it blue. And as you can see here, we have kind of a nice classification into those two moons, a yellow one and a blue one. And in fact, one can not just look at this visually, but one can also measure the mean of the classification of those two moons, for instance. And it turns out that this approach outperforms the two Laplacian and is comparable to the one Laplacian and ginsburg landau methods. And in addition to that, one can also look at the performance for larger data sets, for instance, the core or the sightseer data set, and look also study different types of weights of this approach. And indeed, again, it turns out that it outperforms the two Laplacian and is comparable to uh, planetoid T and planetoid I. So that's kind of very nice that these differential equation-based approaches are actually comparable 
with other types of approaches. So kind of just to summarize, we kind of looked at three equivalent model formulations in the discrete setting, namely the front propagation, the first arrival times, and the discrete icon equations. And it turned out that these three modeling approaches were equivalent, which was very nice in terms of the mathematical analysis, the numerical methods, and the modeling, because we could kind of just use the approach which kind of fitted best to our setting. Then we could um, derive some continuum models for that. And in fact, right now I've mainly spoken about first order methods based on iconal equations, but one can consider similar approaches for second order differential equations as well, where again, the main idea is due to, to the underlying theory and modeling of differential equations, this can be very helpful in terms of getting a better understanding of the quantitative behavior. And last but not least, these approaches were also quite robust for semi-supervised learning. And they seem to be comparable or better than traditional Laplacian-based methods. Now that we're kind of able to understand better how information propagates over a given domain when we only have a very small number of labels. Um, the question is, how can we actually generate more data? And this is uh, exactly what is done in generative modeling, where I'm kind of going to talk a bit about generative adversarial networks and score-based diffusion models. So in general, in generative modeling, we want to learn a probability distribution P from a finite set of given samples. And in fact, there are kind of different types of how one can come up with models for that. So first of all, there are likelihood-based models, where basically the idea is that we want to directly model the probability density and in the end maximize the likelihood. There are lots of um, different approaches which have been suggested in the literature, such as variational autoencoders, normalizing flows, and autoregressive models. But it can be kind of quite difficult to design an appropriate model for a specific setting. And in particular, since we, the idea of likelihood models is to directly model a probability density, this also means that often certain normalizations are required or things like this, which just makes it extremely computation expensive. Then on the other hand, um, implicit models have been suggested where kind of the idea is that one finds samples without knowing the actual underlying density. And here, generative adversarial networks or GANs have been extremely popular in that field. And more recently, Score-based models have also been used where the idea is that one estimates the gradient of the density rather than the probability density function itself. And so with all these different types of generative models, the question arises, which one should one actually consider? So um, the main disadvantage of those likelihood-based models is that they strongly rely on the underlying architectures. And in particular, uh, since we kind of <laughs> want to learn densities, they need to satisfy a certain assumption every density satisfies, like uh, the integral of the density needs to be equal to one. So this requires some normalizations, or we want positivity of the solution. And things like this can make it quite difficult to train such a model. Then on the other hand, one could consider implicit models like uh, guns. And here, the main difficulty is that they may be extremely unstable. Some examples of guns are the so-called Wasserstein guns, which were motivated by the Wasserstein distance. And this is actually what I'm also going to talk about about later on that even though they kind of were mathematically motivated, it still doesn't mean that 
we truly understand what's going on. And last but not least, um, probably the most popular um, approach recently, a score-based model with clear advantages, namely that they don't require any kind of normalization as in the case of likelihood-based models. And here the main reason why this is not required is because you learn basically score matching. You learn uh, how to approximate the gradient of your probability density. Also in terms of um, examples, in many tasks they actually performed extremely well, even better than guns. And from a mathematical point of view, there are actually also other advantages, namely that they have theoretical guarantees and in fact, they are strongly linked with ordinary differential equations, stochastic differential equations, as well as partial differential equations. And in fact, we will also have a preprint available very soon on how we can connect um, score-based diffusion models with the world of differential equations very soon and using mathematical analysis as well as numerical simulations for that. But kind of going back to um, the field of guns, um, here the main idea is that we have two neural networks which are kind of competing against each other. So on the one hand, we have a generator, and on the other hand, we have a discriminator. So And here the idea is that the generator produces samples that should be indistinguishable from the true data. So we have kind of some random noise as an input, then this goes kind of into the generator, and then hopefully the generator produces some realistically looking images. And now the task of the second network, the discriminator is to be able to um, distinguish between the true images and the images which were generated by the generator. And so mathematically speaking, this means that we look at two neural networks. For instance, we can call the generator GC theta on some latent space set with values in X. And we have to train some base theta in such a way that the generator is able to generate realistically looking images. And usually we assume that this latent space set is equipped with some multivariate Gaussian distribution P set. And our data lies in this space X. Um, what's also kind of useful in terms of notation is that we often say that generator distribution is denoted by P theta. And the target distribution is P star. Mm -hmm. So in the end, the generator aims to produce some samples which look very similar to samples from the target distribution. And now the task of the discriminator is to kind of distinguish between those real and those kind of fake generated images. And in particular, the generator uh, the discriminator outputs a probability value where kind of one might stand for real samples and zero might stand for generated samples. And so it's a very strong interaction between the generator and the discriminator, which kind of needs to be understood. In terms of the mathematical formulation, what one basically considers is uh, the discriminator d alpha with Bates alpha wants to maximize the probability that real data is classified as belonging to the real data set. And so this means that we consider uh, maximize this discriminator d alpha. And then on the other hand, we want to uh, minimize the probability that any fake image is classified as belonging to the real data set. So for any 
set in PZ, we want to kind of minimize this associated term. And this is precisely how the discriminator's objective can then be defined. So on the one hand, we want to maximize this term from kind of the top here, and then to kind of bind it into meter form instead of um, adding the minimum in here, we just write the minimum as the maximum of some expectation of log one minus the alpha. And kind of in contrast to that, now that we know the discriminator, the task of the generator is now to find theta in such a way that the discriminator's objective is minimized, which kind of results in this final optimization problem for the generator. And kind of having this um, generator's objective now, the one can actually show that this is related to the minimization of the Jensen Chen divergence. And this is again closely related to the Kulba Plattla divergence. And in particular, this also raises the question if we see now that the generator's objective is closely related to the Jensen Chen divergence, would it make sense to consider other? distances or metrics and kind of come up with other objectives for guns as well. But of course, we don't want just any objective. We want an objective which is good to deal with mathematically. And one of the main disadvantages of the so-called vanilla gun, which I've kind of introduced previously, is that it leads to vanishing gradients. And this is, of course, a very undesirable um, thing because it means that if you use gradient-based methods in terms of the optimization, then it might get stuck somewhere even though we are not at a local or a global minimizer. And secondly, the jensen Chen divergence is maximized when two distributions have disjoint support. And this is again something which is not really desirable. And this, because of this, one could think that maybe Wasserstein distances would work better because in the case of Wasserstein distances, if since they are all related to transfer theory, if we have similar um, support, this also means that generally speaking, uh, then having densities that the Wasserstein distances are also rather small. And this actually suggests that maybe Wasserstein guns are what to go forward for. And in fact, here I've written down the objective of a Wasserstein gun. So in fact, it's very similar to what we have previously. But the main difficulty is that when kind of looking at Wasserstein one distances, we basically have to maximize over Lipschitz functions with Lipschitz constants smaller or equal than one. And this is actually something which is very difficult to enforce as well. So um, kind of the main challenges which one can already see when kind of writing down the Wasserstein gun objective is that Numerically, we can't really optimize over the entire set of von Lipschitz functions. And secondly, um, when kind of looking at this problem of minimizing theta of the Wasserstein von distance between the target distribution and the generated distribution, is that in general we won't have access to the full distributions, but we will only have access to finite samples. And it's not immediately clear whether if something is motivated by minimizing the Wasserstein one distance over the full um, density functions, whether this is actually also equivalent to minimizing 
with respect to finite samples of this density. And in particular, this also means that when implementing this Wasserstein objective, one has to come up with good base on how to kind of deal with these two computational issues, the approximation of the set of all von Lipschitz functions, as well as the tractability in terms of finite samples. And in, this is what we also investigated numerically. But just to kind of summarize the Wasserstein gun algorithm with gradient penalty, penalty as it's kind of usually um, written down. So there are kind of two loops. There's first an outer loop with the aim of minimizing this theta, so the weights of the generator. And there's an inner loop for maximizing over all Lipschitz functions to approximate the optimal discriminator. And so um, one needs to introduce some auxiliary functions where basically the first auxiliary function is kind of just the original form of the objective which we had in here. And the second uh, auxiliary function is related to the fact that we want to approximate the Lipschitz constant being equal to one. So this can be approximated by some expectation of uh, gradient of the discriminator minus one kind of being roughly close to zero in the ideal scenario. And then one can construct a loss function where one needs to kind of scale this residual <laughs> of how well the Lipschitz condition are satisfied accordingly, and then kind of can proceed with the minimization, hoping that everything works as expected. And indeed, the loss function approximates the Wasserstein one distance. However, if one kind of looks at numerical examples here, you can see some examples. Um, which Jan Stamsovic, in fact, all those simulations were done by my PhD student Jan. And um, for instance, when looking at fixed finitely supported distributions, what one can see is that uh, the core value of the Wasserstein distance between our target distribution and our uh, generated distribution should be 41. But in fact, it turns out that in all these examples, the Wasserstein distance computed by the Wasserstein gun are significantly smaller than that. Like here, they were on the order of four. And for some other values of lambda, which kind of regulated the, how much this Lipschitz constant one was considered, it was even smaller than that. And even when normalizing things, it didn't really get much better either. Like then it was even here, as you can see on the picture on the bottom right, in the order of 0 0.8, so even further away from the correct value of 41. So it definitely demonstrates that for finally supported fixed distributions where we can exactly compute the Wasserstein distance using theory of optimal transfer, this doesn't seem to coincide at all. So this entire motivation of using a Wasserstein distance doesn't really seem to make so much sense. And in fact, one can also study this more empirically by looking at the expected sample Wasserstein one distance and kind of, for instance, for some given images like cell A and C4, where we know the intrinsic dimension, since it's known that the intrinsic dimension is quite relevant in terms of sample complexity issues. And we, of course, we want to try to avoid those. However, it turns out that when kind of studying this, we need a huge number of samples to actually obtain a satisfying Wasserstein one distance. So if you consider the Wasserstein one distance between 
samples from the same distribution, one would hope that it's kind of something close to zero. But what you can kind of see on the left-hand side is that if you consider 10,000 samples, which is kind of still already a reasonable number of samples, the Wasserstein, the expected Wasserstein one distance between those is still above three. So if we kind of increase the number of samples even further, then we could kind of extrapolate on how many samples we would actually need to have that Wasserstein one distance kind of something reasonably small. And it turns out that to obtain it reasonably small, we kind of need to be in the order of 10 to the power 40, 10 to the power 50 samples, which is just computationally impossible at all. So what this kind of exploration already shows is that the batch Wasserstein distance is not really what we want. And if one kind of looks at the associated pictures, which one kind of gets out of this, here on the um, left-hand side, you can see the expected Wasserstein distance between batches from the same distribution, kind of the one where we would hope that it's close to zero, but it's not. Then here in the middle, we um, compute the expected Wasserstein distance between this given batch as well as an average batch, which kind of ends up to be around 47, so slightly better than the one on the left-hand side. And in fact, one could also come up with geometric k-means clustering images and the associated batches for that and compute the Wasserstein distance. And in fact, it's even smaller than that, which kind of clearly demonstrates that there's a bias in terms of geometric k-means clustering. And so one minima are definitely uh, shown here. And in fact, one can also look at this more mathematically, but since I'm running kind of out of time, I just shortly need to talk a bit about what is actually the problem with all of that. Like we <laughs> looked at different aspects of the Wasserstein gun and noticed that there are um, issues, for instance, in terms of sample complexity, and even when kind of having an analytical solution available that was fixed, finite, distributed um, samples, it still didn't work. So what's actually the underlying problem of it? And we think that kind of one of the major issues is actually related to the fact that we can write down the Wasserstein one distance as the minimum over the sum of L2 distances. And to kind of give some intuition of how this might cause some problems, I have here a couple of pictures. So on the left-hand side, you kind of see some kind of reference picture. In the middle, you see a slightly altered picture and we compute the associated Wasserstein distance for that. And on the right-hand side, we see a picture which looks clearly completely different to our reference picture. But in fact, the Wasserstein distance is always smaller than what we see in the middle, even though kind of visually speaking, the middle one and the left one are very similar to each other, whereas kind of in terms of the Wasserstein distance, in fact, the one at the left and the one at the right are closer to each other, which kind of shows that there are fundamental underlying issues related to perceptual distances. And yeah, so kind of just to summarize in terms of the Wasserstein guns, um, we looked at different ways of training Wasserstein guns, which seem to fail to approximate the Wasserstein distance correctly. And there are several issues behind that. Why the batch Wasserstein distance wasn't really the best choice, mainly in terms of sample complexity issues. But since we were kind of still not completely satisfied with the best 
was a certain is distance, we kind of looked a bit further, and it seems that there might be fundamental problems related to the underlying Euclidean distance or the L2 norm. And one can also look at other aspects like regularization, but this also didn't seem to be making too many differences. So kind of just to wrap up, I hope I could show you that um, quite different areas of mathematics, including applied analysis and differential equation, numerical analysis and optimization, can be quite helpful for understanding data science and machine learning problems. And in fact, once we kind of develop the underlying mathematics for that, we can also explore the translation to applications such as in biology and climate science. And thanks a lot for listening.